based experience. In other words, you, you can't really replicate what we do here in the classroom. You've got to come out here and we're going to be outside. We don't, you know, we're, we've got a classroom in here, but obviously it's not real big and we're, we're not going to be doing most of our stuff here. We're outside. And so because of that, we are at the mercy of nature. Now, already our program is limited to certain months of the year. Uh, we are looking at, you know, March, which is, you know, tomorrow, April, May, and then school is out. Mm -hmm. In June, we do teacher training because our program relies on the teachers knowing what we do. So we do new, new teacher training. We shut down for the month of July because, you know, Haley and I don't really get vacations on any other time. So, but July is, is, is hot and it's really not hospitable out here. Um, even though people think it's, we should come out in July. No, it's really not pleasant to be out there without water and stuff. So we shut down for July. So we start again in August, you know, when school starts, and then September, October, and then the first couple weeks, you know, climate change, you know, the first couple weeks of November, we can still do stuff. Mm -hmm. um, it, it's that once you start getting close to Thanksgiving, then we're pretty much shut down. And then we do our end of year stuff, and then we start with dose and training again. So it's just, you can see what the year's like. So, our big months are coming up for, this, for spring, and the weather policy has to be clearly stated. You know, everybody needs to understand that if it's raining, kids are not having fun. If, if it's miserable, then nothing's happening. There's no learning happening. It's just, it's miserable. So we, if it is 51% or more chance of rain, and we can see the, you know, now thank goodness for radar, if you can see the clouds moving in, we will make predictions and we will cancel. So it's basically 51% or more equals cancellation. If there is lightning, <laughs> we're going to cancel, okay? Um, even if there's like little pockets, uh, you know, we're, we're not going to take kids up Butterfly Hill if it's lightning. We just are not going to do it. So, you know, rain being the big thing. Now wind, wind is just part of the deal. You know, we don't charge extra for wind. <laughs> <laughs> so it's just part of the deal. However, if you get wind gusts above 40 miles an hour, 40 to 50 miles an hour, you are no longer effective in communicating with your groups. And it gets, in my mind, it gets really treacherous for a bus to be out there in 40 mile an hour wind gusts going up the hill, out there on the bison loop. So that, if it gets super windy, I will cancel it, like over 40 mile an hour wind gusts. Um, so that's the weather policy. And typically, uh, if you are signed up for an activity, it is my job to let you know by 7 o'clock. I have been known to call people, but it's, and it's like, it's still dark outside. I'm like, yeah, but I'm letting you know. <laughs> I don't, I don't, I have people that will drive in from as far as Kansas City on this side mm -hmm. and Salina on the other side. I have docents and, and I do not want them to be driving in when I'm canceling. So I, I, I err on calling too early rather than too late. And I will call and let you know that it's canceled. Um, so that's the policy. Haley, did you want to add to that at all? No. Nope. Anything you want to think of? And then Haley, Haley gets the docent's names and phone numbers to me. And it's kind of the docent's jobs to be, to have your phone next yeah. to you. Um, so. Quick one. It, it sounds like you you were responsible for calling over weather and you're letting us know. Yes. What if we're out here and the weather changes drastically with like predicting? Would you make the call or we make the call? Oh, <coughs> so if you are out, once you're out with the group, mm -hmm. uh, we hope that you have your cell phone with you. And so what we have is we have a list of the docents' names and their cell phones. Mm -hmm. And so we will call you and let you know. If you feel like you've got a dangerous situation, any kind of dangerous situation, a child has been hurt, mm -hmm. teacher's been hurt, um, you can call us. Okay. So that's another thing. Please have your cell phones. Oh, these are kind of rules. 
Yes, we give you a list of, of the when you we give you our numbers as well, and so we're the entire network should be within contact of the cell phones. And really, there's only a couple places on Conza where the cell phone reach is not good, and that's at the Hokinson Homestead. Mm -hmm. um, you, all you have to do is just walk up the trail a little bit, and you've got you've got connection again. Okay. Um, don't let me forget to introduce you. This is Chad Hedinger, one of our experienced docents. He's he's taken the that's where Ken sat yesterday. So you're in the the seasoned the seasoned docent chair. Okay. So. Uh, Chad has been a docent since 2000. See? Do I get points for knowing that? <laughs> <laughs> uh, he is on the fire crew and he helps lead the Prairie Chicken Tours and he's the, the scout for the Prairie Chicken Tours. Um, anything else that you would like to add? No. <laughs> I, I do, if I'm in town, I do the flower walks in June. I will, I, will, I will tell you that when I went through the class in 2000, the only wildflower that I knew was the sunflower. Mm -hmm. So I got the guide, wildflower guide, and I hiked the nature trail March through October three times a week. It's a good way to lose weight. Mm -hmm. uh, that's the second time that's come up. <laughs> uh, and, but I will tell you, I don't know scientific names. Um, Probably 95% of the people that do the flower walk or don't care about scientific names. Mm -hmm. But if you walk with Earl Allen to do the nature trail, which is two and a half miles, it'll take you five or six hours because <laughs> he's explaining the wildflowers to you. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'll worry you about it. Yeah, you've already been worried about Earl, but I'll introduce you guys to Earl. <laughs> if you don't know him, he's a, he's a character. We have a lot of characters. That's what makes it fun out here. <laughs> What's up with that? Let me tell you, I'm not even associated with Kansas State University. Uh, I was a specialty food salesman to grocery stores. However, I was a scoutmaster and have enjoyed the outdoors. And uh, one of the docent, uh, one of the Eagle Scouts' mother went through the class in '99. Said, "I thought you would be enjoying this class." this adventure, and so I went in 2000, like Jill said, and they just can't get rid of me. <laughs> Jill would like to sometimes. Uh, Jill, when did you start? I, I started six years ago. Six years ago. When we, we moved here from Texas, stalking my child. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the, uh, uh, the classes back then were Saturdays usually from March clear up until May, and then you came back in September for four Saturdays. But Jill has changed that. She's looking for people that are retired that can help them. <laughs> well, and, and it, it made sense because we were getting a lot of, of folks who were interested in the tall grass prairie but were not available to help lead school groups. And so I was, I was educating a lot of people who were not going to be available to, to come out and actually do docenting. So it, a change needed to happen. Mm -hmm. So, and plus, you know, I like to have Saturdays. <laughs> <laughs> Honestly, yeah, you know, it's kind of nice to have a Saturday. Okay, so let's take a look at our schedule. Um, and apparently, I had Google up here and it disappeared. That board went to sleep. Yep. There we go. Okay. Um, yeah, you can leave it on. Thanks, Chuck. So the KEEP website is where this is how we communicate with the world. And so I wanted just to let you know what it looks like and to navigate a little bit around that. Um, I could give you the address, but it's a whole lot easier to just go to Google and do Kanza KEEP. There it is. Okay. Is easy. The address is there, keep.consa.kstate.edu. Um, you can decide how you would like to get there. But there's our website. This menu on the left is what you really would work best if you got to know this. Okay. Um, this is quite simple here on our front page, just telling what our goals are, 
where educators, teachers can go, the docent program, teachers workshops, the hands-on science activities, me and Haley. Um, obviously, I need to update this. But this is the art show that I mentioned yesterday that Kelly is going to be in next year, so I'm going to update that. No, no pressure, Kelly. <laughs> I'm sure you've got stuff that it's all ready, right? Uh, the visit us tab. This is mainly for the general public who are going to the nature trail, and so there's a easy map. You probably know this, but there's a lot of people, especially new students and new military, who don't know how to get to Conza Prairie. And so this map shows them where it's found, how to get there from either the east or the west, the three trails, the, the length of the trails. Even in the world of GPS, people still argue with us about how long the trails are. <laughs> they leave us messages like, you know, <laughs> we should change everything because they're GPS says. Um, so here's the map. You may have seen all this before, but here's the <clears> typical <throat> trail, which about 95% of our visitors will take. Again, here's the Hokanson home site down here. The Godwin Hill Trail that I had mentioned yesterday, this is the trail that we will walk as a, as a group at the end of docent training, right before docent graduation, we get together and walk this loop. We do not start at the kiosk. Rather, we start right back here, and we take, we drive, there's a gravel road here called Shane Creek Lane, and we park at the bottom of the hill, and then we, we walk up the hill, so it's, it's actually quite a bit longer than just the, the tail end of the trail, because we're walking up a, a quite steep hill, and then we walk around, and then come back, and then walk back, and it's, uh, the end of August, and it's very pretty that time of year. Mm -hmm. Got lots of golden rod. <coughs> it's just a beautiful time of year to be out there walking with the group. And I'm sure Chad will be there. <laughs> you gonna be there at the end of August? <laughs> what happens is usually everybody goes one way and I go the other. <laughs> he knows where the good ones are. The good what? <laughs> <laughs> Oh. Uh, <laughs> usually it's because Earl goes with everybody right. and he takes forever. Right. And I right. don't want to take forever. Right, right. So you do not have to stay with the group. You can pick the group you want to go with at the level of detail that you would like to immerse yourself in. Um, but it's, it's really fun to go with folks who really know plants because it, it does become a plant walk. And it becomes an in-depth plant walk. And so if there were flowers that you had wondered what they were, you will have people there who can tell you. Or grasses, really obscure grasses. There will be people there who can tell you what they are. And then they will tell you in depth how to remember them, which... Why they give Has you, it worked for you? <laughs> you know, and I've done this six times. Why they give the level of that depth. And like, okay. So, no, it does not. Um, and then here's where we try mainly to, to give some of the rules, including the no dogs, no bikes. Um, and so no amount of, of, I guess, advertising seems to be completely effective. We try. Um, somebody said you should just say no pets because well, people will bring out their cats. And their peacocks. And their peacocks. <laughs> and their, their, their ferrets. Their peacocks. Horses. Well, if you see down here, you know, horses. But if you have somebody who is that conscientious to check this, they're probably not going to be, you know, so we're, we're appealing to a certain audience who already is conscientious, and that's not the ones who are breaking the rules, right? So just remember there's trail cams out there watching you. <laughs> that aren't up right now, but regardless. <laughs> Um, and we do have the, the self-guided map, self-guided tour map, and so the PDF for that is available online. The paper copies are available in the kiosk. We'll let this load. So it didn't say on there, but I think I heard that somebody strung up an amic just to take a map. And yeah, that, that has happened, yes. Well, yeah, I mean, to me that doesn't 
seem to be a big problem. It's not that, they never they don't leave them there. No, it's and it's it's not damaging anything. Right. But is that that's not a is that a rule or not a rule? That's just one. that's that's a that's a shade of gray. And okay. if it happens, and I was out there, I I might say something or I just might just walk by. It depends on my mood. Honestly. I mean, to me, it's no different it's not than taking a blanket out and laying down on the grass. If it's not damaging anything, I might, that, and I'm, and that I just don't, damaging. and I don't feel like dealing with it. Yeah, but the rule is you're supposed to stay on the trail. Yeah. Right. And if you yeah. go off trail and put the hammock on, that's... Yes. People might think I, you can it. camp there if they see a hammock. Yeah, yeah. no, okay. it's not, and, and the, no that's camp. the impression that it's a park. Yeah. yeah. But if you're out there with your family, you know, I'll let you guys decide how you <laughs> I just saw, I mean, I, I, I was uh, laughing that you have drone rules now, so. I've been noticing these hammocks more and more. It seems one campus kids are yeah. stringing them between trees, and uh, really? I've seen them in parks. Yeah, 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 my daughter's got I, I, take, I take responsibility. <laughs> <Is that laughs> yeah. you do that? I've got about eight hammocks. <laughs> <laughs> they're, they're, they seem more and more popular. Well, they are. you can they carry are. something in your pocket like this and string right. it on a tree to take a nap, I mean, you think about chiggers and everything else, why wouldn't you? Yeah. Right. So anyway, here's here's yeah. the the self-guided tour, and we've got, if you might be familiar with the QR codes, yeah. and it's basically just a font that uh, they scan that and it links them to a site that can give them more information on these particular topics. So these are... This is available online, and so it's helpful for docents to know that the map or that the and the map and the brochure is available online. I, I gotta say, I really appreciate the fact that you trained those collared lizards to be there on that part. We of the have, place. we have, <laughs> and, and they behave. Okay. And the education site is again for the teachers, and this is where we list the options, guidelines for student groups and tours, uh, basically telling them that it's, uh, we will have a docent for every 10 kids, be on time, be dressed properly, have water, sunscreen. Um, and we do do pre and post assessment tests, and those are mainly for the kids who are participating in the experiential or the science activities. Mm -hmm. We have them take a pre-test, and it's the same, <coughs> it's all online. And it's you know one kid per per test here, and they can just do it online. And there's three segments. There is the opinion. You know, I like to go outside. When I go outside, I see stuff. I think Kansas is a great place to live. I think touching insects is gross. You know, so there's opinion. Uh, and then there is. There we go. Right here. We need to break, we need to have like a line or something because here's the second part <coughs> for knowledge bison or wild animals. And these are things that ostensibly we are covering with them mm -hmm. during their visit. And so we're checking to see their comprehension of these facts improves after their visit. So we have a pre test. <coughs> I made my students always write about their field trips, so they had to. So it reinforces that. it. Uh huh. They do that ahead of time. Yep. <coughs> so, very simple test, and this is for um, middle school. And so it gives us a way to assess the effectiveness of our program. And what's interesting, we've got um, four years worth of assessments so far, and we're seeing that their attitudes, their opinions on things are not really changing. And you know, they're only here for like three or four hours. Mm -hmm. But their knowledge is obviously improving. They're learning. And then the summer teachers workshop, there's a brochure for that. I'm just going to take a second. And if you've got teachers who are interested in that, the the reason to do this workshop, it's a week-long workshop where the, the teachers participate in each one of our activities. The reason really to do this is because once they go through this workshop, they get to come out here for free for the rest of their career, and their students get to participate in the hands-on activities. Mm -hmm. so they, kids don't get to do that until their teachers have gone through this. Mm -hmm. okay, that's what qualifies the kids to do the hands-on stuff. And then we will pay for their buses. 
Okay, so their school buses get covered. Her ecology, this is a fun page. So this is, this is info. Okay. So if you wanted to know um, the phenology, okay, so phenology, the timing of things. When, okay, so the killdeer made it to the phenology page. When was the first day in the spring that the killdeer arrived? Okay, so it was February 27th. Okay, let's go to animals. Okay, so killdeer. <laughs> Ha, ah, I got it last year. <laughs> so we get, we get attribution, and so it becomes a little competitive. <laughs> Not saying. <laughs> okay, so last year it was February 21st. Okay, so, and then the year before that, it was the 27th. The year before that was March 9th. And so we've got data. Oh, interesting. Cool. And we have data. This, this says 2011. We have data going back to 2001. Okay, this is just part of it because the, the web page... Gave, had a fit about the file being too big, so I had to break it up. How would they, oh, is the back to 2001 further down, or how would they get to that? Okay. I see, I got it. Well, and this is the plants, and All I'm right. going to have to put, I'm going to have to find the old, okay. I'm going to find the old animal data and put it up there. Um, but yeah, the plants, and this is for blooming, and so the red or slippery elm, ooh, it's probably going to be blooming here pretty soon. Yeah, and you can see where. So this is just when people notice and they contact. Yep. Going you. out and walking and yeah. turning it in. Okay. Okay. So who you turn it into? See, she's is be right. Contact her, and if you're interested in participating in that, bwm at ksu edu. That's her contact. Sort of question well, I'm just thinking about how is, uh, that would be interesting how she's gathering the data. I mean, so the, the first one who this is her? this is called citizen science. Yeah. So this is just whoever sees it, and you're kind of counting on the fact that whoever saw it actually knows what they're seeing. You're right. Yeah. And you're assuming that they can identify it, and mm -hmm. they're turning it in, and she's and taking she their word for it. Does it, and then you're that's it. There's there's no. For instance, Formal did you scientific. tell her that you heard the killdeer yesterday? Yeah, but I got I got pipped. Somebody turned it in. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Ask me if I'm happy about that. And for Alice. No, oh. no, it wasn't Alice. It was so Jeff Taylor. Oh, well, he spends all his time on this. He does. You'll meet Jeff Taylor. He's a lovely person. It's a good idea to go in here and see just which category she's keeping track of. Pardon me? It's a good idea to go ahead and take a look at what the database is, what, what the interests yes. are. Yes. A lot of times you think you're the first one to see it, you go to it, that website, and say, hmm, I missed it by two weeks. Yeah. Yeah. So. yeah. Yeah, you don't know. You don't know. You just turn it in and you don't know if you got the application or not. So we can probably spend a lot of time here, but this is. This is where the list of species are. Um, one thing I wanted to show you, if you're looking for a historical perspective on the tall grass prairie, an educational historical perspective, you know, talking about settlers, Homestead Act, plow, etc. I've got an essay here. Okay, so here's the, you know, with the map, what tall grass looks like, history. <coughs> There's our bird chickens. Fur oh, yeah. dogs. We do not have furry dogs here. Do you know why? It's too shallow. Oh, it's too shallow. Oh. They would all have helmets on. We have pocket gophers. <laughs> we have pocket gophers, but we do not have furry dogs. Uh, places where you can see furry. Okay, so locations and how many, how many acres they have of tall grass furry. Mm -hmm. So if you want to make a pilgrimage. <clears throat> okay. So there's that. Um, the docent website, there's from our last roundup and awards ceremony. There's Todd. He's like, where is he? Uh, if you have not seen this yet, the docent handbook is on here. That's so if you, yes, that is as a PDF. So there they all are in the same categories. 
the, this is behind uh, security. The yes, username is Dosen. Yes. I was thinking so you know, that Dosen is a volunteer, yeah. It's the website. Is Dosen, password volunteer, all lowercase. It's under the key. Under key? Yeah. What page? So if if you need to access the binder and you don't have the binder with you, you can access it on your phone. Computer. Everything's a PDF. If you needed to see the bison fact sheet, the bison facts, there you go. It's all there. So, do you, when the students come out, get photo releases? I mean, I'm assuming that those students are taking pictures. I try to keep a handle on that. Mm -hmm. And for that reason, mm -hmm. and so the if the kids are posted in here, there's photo releases, and there's and the the teachers know about it, and the mm -hmm. parents know about it. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, it's well, back of their heads. Well, teachers know who not to have. Yes. Those. So that yes. should be right. good. It just maybe I would just ask them. That's why you see Before like the these day. pictures. A lot of them you can't yeah. really see their faces. Right. That's why a lot of these are just the backs of their heads, and when. When docents take pictures and post them, see, backs of their heads. When docents take pictures and post them, I try to say, don't post the faces of the kids. Yeah. Okay. We try to keep a handle on that. Okay. All right. Um, I just wanted to show you the name tags. Once you graduate, those are the name tags you'll be wearing, uh, just so everyone knows who you are. They, if you didn't get, a trail vest, they're up here if you wanted one. Yes, you've earned them. It's not like you have to graduate before you get a vest. <laughs> um, ours went through the weather policies. We are going to go out and see Kansas. So I've got some laminated maps. You do not have to take your personal ones. Uh, I do need these back. This will give you an idea of. I'm just going to take this side. Give you an idea of where we are. I know. Okay, so take a look at your maps. And you are going to want to turn your maps upside down. Okay. Because we're starting in the far northwest corner. We are starting at HQB and we are going out. And so everything is gonna be I mean if this makes more sense as we approach it. If you don't like looking at things upside down, you are welcome to turn it back around. But we are going HQB, and we're going to go in between N20A and N2A as we approach it. There are two gates, and and we're not really doing we're not really doing the Bison Loop. We're doing a Kanza tour, okay? And so we're going to go to the south east or the southwest corner as much as the roads allow. Um, yeah, we're going to go down. Okay, so you see the R1A and R20A. Yeah, that's where we're um, Yeah, we're going to go see some of those some of those watersheds down there. We may have to walk a little bit uh, because the roads are not gravel. There's there's really only a couple of gravel roads out there. <coughs> um, so we're we're really doing a tour of Kanza, and we're we're looking at how the watersheds are laid out and how they're labeled, and just getting a feel for it for right now. Um, there are two entrances out to the prairie, there is the west entrance, because okay, we're on the west side, and that's the entrance we're gonna take today. But there's also an east entrance. And my guess is that is the one that we will be coming back through. Okay, so there's two gates, and the gates are locked. And we'll give you the combination to those on Thursday when we do the bison. No, Friday. 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 Is that when we're trustworthy? <laughs> We, we've kind of already said, yeah, <laughs> good enough. So, uh, yeah, we'll give you the combination. We'll have everybody practice opening the gates because we found even with the practice, 
<laughs> okay, so I didn't say this last year. If you need your reading glasses, bring your reading glasses because the. Oh, thank you. Yes, bring your reading glasses because it's very small numbers on. It's just a master lock and it's very small. So we have behind us the blue gray metal building we call the Columbian building because that is the name of the manufacturing. If you have really good eyes, you can see up there at the, at the peak, it says Columbian. And so sometimes we'll say, especially we have a, a trail running race here every year in September, and the, the start and finish is at the Columbian building. So we'll say, okay, meet at the Columbian building, and we'll go from there. Um, and then we have just storage. We do have some research back there with uh, prairie restoration. Uh, so you'll see flags and uh, things in storage of research equipment, etc. <coughs> Here we have what they call the cottages. This is where the researchers stay. That's part of it. That's a challenge. Oh, uh, I guess. Yeah. All right, moving on. The greener, <laughs> What's that? Greener house. Right, right. And so these are all the folks that we met yesterday. Oh. This is where they're staying. So are they being hired oh. as part of employees here, or they're working on a project for temporary They are employees? working. They are working on a KSU initiated project, and so they qualify for housing here. And it's a KSU biology initiated project. Their research is not here on Kanza, but they they do get to stay here. It is not free. They're paying for the project is paying for their accommodations. Um, yeah, but these are the technicians that are from all over the place. So they'll work for the whole summer or something like they, that? They will be going out to right. western Kansas to catch prairie chickens. So they're here to get their training on how to do it. And so all of that is coordinated with Barb Van Slyke, whose office is up there by mine. That's <coughs> her job is to, and, and you get to, or you will get to experience that, um, because people come through here. And so it's her job to make sure that there's accommodations for them and that they're not double booked. They get fed? No. no. Oh, jeez. <laughs> <laughs> no. No, they have to bring their own food. Ah, oh, well, the ramen noodles they can <coughs> Yes. Um, and Chad, Chad stopped here, and so there's a storm shelter, uh, which may or may not affect you. We're not going to have you guys out here if there's a chance of a treacherous weather, but, you know, a lot of times the graduate students are. But the other, the other uh, safe place is the Holbert Center is where our headquarters is in Dogwood, Rough Lake Dogwood, not the pretty North Carolina Dogwood, um, the ugly Rough Lake <coughs> Dogwood. And these are clonal, so they are most likely uh, one organism with rhizominous uh, connections below ground. And so if you were to just chop one down, you know, it's like the deuces. Right. Hey, you know, the other one comes yeah. back up. Makes it nice. Sometimes. Yeah, it's so they call them shrub islands because they have the original mother plant in the center and they expand out from the center in kind of a roundish shape. So it's very, very difficult to kill them, to eliminate them once their rhizomes have established themselves. Uh, the fire, once they're established, fire will not do it because. And, and the fire will just sputter. <coughs> well, it might burn or singe a couple of the outer stems, but it will not get into the middle. It will not get to the heart of it. So very difficult to control. Well, it's very said that they form such dense stands that it's not good habitat for well, it is a, Oh, it's great habitat it's for really songbirds. You know, if you're at Bell's Vireo, it's a great place to be. They can, they can move but through there, okay. for, for many other things, <coughs> no. So just take a look at the quality of the vegetation and realize that that shrubs and, and really trees um, are not ideal for a prairie.
safe, there's not any visible bias, and the kids can get out of the bus and they can see this. Um, if you're really brave, I wouldn't break open one of the fresh ones, but I would break open one of the dry bison dungs because you might be surprised. Um, you know, you know that, that uh, early homesteaders used them for a fuel source. Because the bison so efficiently utilize their food, all that's left basically is cellulose, is sawdust. And so there's very little in the way of bacteria. I mean, they really... <laughs> Yay! We got a bison chip Go right for here. it! Yeah. Yes, the bison chip. Thank you. Break it open. It does look like sawdust. Um, mm -hmm. If you're brave, go ahead and smell it. It's not going to smell bad. <laughs> oh my God! That was picture worthy. <laughs> <laughs> picture. What I have it on. I have it on video. <laughs> yeah. Wait, do it again. <laughs> Excellent. Now, does it smell bad? No, it I doesn't. Didn't. I don't like it. I didn't know. It's very it fresh. So it's well. earthy. It is. It's yeah. really fresh and really earthy, and and you could do that with the kids. And I've got latex gloves if you're, you know, if you're not as brave as Chad, but you're not going to get just a lot of stuff on your hands because it is basically sawdust mm -hmm. um you know and i've had kids bring them back and we dissected them under the stereo microscope and there's just not a whole lot going on in there and so that just it, it leads you to the conclusion that bison are incredibly efficient with their food the bad yeah. thing about these is when you do a fire they smolder like forever uh. and so when we do the fires we have to actually start doing what they call <clears throat> Stump. Kicks <laughs> back into the black. So what? you could call it poop kicks. <laughs> the poop kick. Okay. For the kids. Yeah. What do you mean? <laughs> <laughs> because they smolder. They just keep smoldering on and on and on. If they, if you leave at night. Oh, I see. They're, they're dangerous. And the plus they blow. It. They're really lightweight. Okay. okay so see. here's our guys. If you want to see them. <coughs> oh, I see. And and you can see Butterfly Hill Trail. And uh -huh. if you were a group of kids, you would just turn to the left and you would have the bison right there. How yeah. cool is that? Yeah. Those kids would have been pretty excited. Do you, when you pull the chips over, do you find termites under up here very much? I've never seen termites, but you see the dung beetles sometimes uh -huh. with the yeah. fresh. Okay. You know. Yeah. The why, do, bugs. why do they like to wallow in the same spot? You know, why not just It's wallow really all interesting. Over? Um, you know, they, they're, they're covering themselves with mud for, to get rid of the, you know, control the biting flies and to scratch themselves and, you know, they want the mud and so they're going to the established wallows and the, and the bison will revisit, obviously, established wallows year after year, but they will also make new ones. What's interesting is we have, and, and this is the bison area, outside of the fence is not the bison area. We have wallows outside of the bison fence. Yep. Do you know how they got there? Brad's already there. Well, I've seen the wallows over there. They're, 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 from, the they're from the 1800s. Yeah. 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 They're, they're, still they're still there. They stay there They're long. still there from the 1800s. When there were bison here before human settlement, they're still there. There's one on the nature trail, and we'll see it when we Nothing walk Godwin Hill. Actually, there's two on the well, nature trail. Well, it, it, it's water every, every spring. Yeah. I mean, in these so not, not plants growing there. They're, they're just small. It's grass. a different type of plant that's yeah. inside. You can oh, see. Yeah, it's yeah. the plant. Yeah, and it's very, it's very clay-based. <coughs> you know, and, and you're getting the compacted clay, and so it becomes ecologically completely different from the surrounding area, mm -hmm. and so it functions as a mini marsh. And so, once we get standing water, we will get frogs, and we will get the crustaceans. Well, they're cysts because yeah. there's actually an organism in there. And suspended animation it's as opposed an to an egg yeah. that's an embryo. An embryo, yeah. yeah. So it's not an embryo. Wow. It's very cool. It it's really cool things. <laughs> I went home yesterday thinking about how many things you found to look at just in that little walk, uh, you know, past the buffalo and the bison enclosure. And uh, <coughs> I, I was really amazed. <laughs> and looking at the poop, you know, it looked funny. And, and, uh, so I don't know. It's, it, I mean, there's, there's, and, and it yeah. changes constantly. Yeah. And so that's half the fun is is finding them or having the kids find them and pointing them out. Like the galls. Okay. <coughs> we have we have galls. So you see the round? Oh yeah. Okay, so so this is a plant response to an insect egg. And we have two different shapes representative of two different species of insect. Oh. The this the one. plant 
the plant recognizes the fact that these are these are invading proteins. Okay? And so, you know, just like just like an allergic response, right? Mm -hmm. It's an invading protein. And so the plant says, uh, this is bad news. I'm going to encapsulate it and keep it from harming my healthy tissues. Um, That's the goldenrod, yeah. So we have a goldenrod uh, gall fly and a goldenrod gall moth. And the fly egg makes the round gall and the moth egg makes the oblong. When and so green, it's, they're easier to cut. Yeah, <laughs> don't cut yourself, and, please. And notice that you've got an exit hole on this yeah. one and that one. Right, yeah. right. So they've hatched out. And so it's the, the adaptation is that the insect has taken the plant's response hmm. and hmm. kind of incorporated it into right their yeah. into their yeah. healthy lifestyle. And so the it's, so the insects got a little apartment house. Just, just dropped onto the ground. Did you say yeah. the fly was the round one? Oh, wow. Yeah, because the fly is kind of a round body. shape. Yeah. That was a and the moth, moth is kind of an oblong shape. Oh, that makes sense. This is the fly. Okay. Yeah, the is the plant is trying to so push the bug out, out or just nope. protect itself? Protect itself. Okay. It encapsulates Eat itself. itself out and you would find a hole. See, this did not have a hole, so yeah. I knew the, the larvae was still in there. And so this. I hit that larvae and it dropped to the ground. Oh. So, this this is a common this response. Yeah. To yeah. The larvae. Mm -hmm. yeah. This is a common response in plants. You know, plants will do that when they get infected by something. They encapsulate it. I did. <laughs> okay, so the, the reason I stopped was really the poop. Oh, go Carol. Yeah. <laughs> and so what does that tell you? They like it here. They like it here. Remember what I said about the bison? They go up. Bison really like to go up to the top. And so, so that's a lesson to tell the kids. How can you tell where the bison are hanging out? They're hanging out, you know, because can see the poop. The poop's telling you where they are. Yeah. And if you look around, do you see any trails? Yeah. Sure. Sure. There's all kinds of trails. You see where they've rubbed on this trail. Like so. Yeah, so you're yeah, seeing nice. you're seeing evidence, you're seeing sign. No sign of use. They're just like any other animal, they don't like to have to expend more energy than they have to. They're gonna follow if you look behind us. Look at the look at the side of the road. They're gonna follow trails. They're not going to blaze new trails. They're going to follow established trails and, and, and move. And they move single file a lot of times and just kind of slowly amble around. Um, like Don said, here's one of our dominant woody invading plants. And you can always tell smooth sumac, well, oftentimes tell smooth sumac because of the cone at the top. So these woody Woody stems, which are thicker than the rough leaf dogwood, sumac stems are like the thickness of my pinky, will have a cone on top and it's really easy to see, right? Can you tell that now? Yeah. Anyone want to go out and go look at it? We'll see it later. But take a look at the hillside. You see the grayish round islands of shrubs, shrub islands. Um, just like the, the dogwood, the sumac is clonal and they are connected under, underground with rhizomes. And so this is like one organism. So right now, in February, the bison are highly dispersed. They are not all one bird, they're highly dispersed. They, and we'll talk more about this on our bison day, uh, but the girls are in charge. They, <laughs> the girls are in charge. Uh, the matriarchs take the, the groups wherever they want to go, and it's the old, 
the old cows. <laughs> the old cows take take the groups and are in charge of movement. And so they right now are looking for some food and they are waiting for the burn crew to come out. Middle of the bison area. This fence effectively divides the north the north side from the south side. During the end of October, we will gradually push the herd out of the south side into the north side because we want to bring them in to the corral, right? We want them to be able to come back out. I mean, once we push them close, we close the gate behind them. So this is called, these are the two phases of the bison area. We have the south phase, or phase two, and the north phase, phase one. And so in October, those gates will be closed. And they're closed because we don't want the bison leaking back out, you know, just like blood out of the valve. We don't want the, we don't want the, the bison leaking back out. And so if you're doing a bison loop tour in October, sometimes you'll have bison there at that gate. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And so you might have to be opening the gate and playing interference so this is why we have two docents go along uh, with the bus. And so they just close the gate and or open the gate, bus goes through, close the gate behind them. We've never had, we haven't lost anybody so yet. It's dicey for me. We haven't <laughs> lost anybody <laughs> yet. But, but it happens, you know, and, and if they won't get out of the way, <coughs> just turn around and go back. A lot of docents will, will say, this looks like a milk can. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay, so how many how many elementary school kids have ever seen yeah. a metal yeah. milk can in their life? Yeah. So they'll say that, but the kids have absolutely no idea what they mean. It, it, to them, it kind of looks like the bottom of a rocket. Yeah. But it's a rain gauge. And so do you see the letters at the bottom where it says N2B? Okay, so that's just the name of the watershed that it's in. <coughs> um, I think they're reflective. Oh, okay. I think they're reflective. Um, but why the fence around it? Why is there a fence around the rain cage? Yeah, because what would the bison do? Knock it over. Or scratch. Yeah. Limestone. And the shale being softer and more erodible than the hard limestone. But the shale is also more compact. So water will sit on top of the shale as it has gone through the cracks of the limestone. So oftentimes you'll see trees that look like they're growing out of the limestone. Well, the trees have actually tapped in, the roots have tapped into the water that's sitting under the limestone on top of the shale. You can see right here is a really good example of this dogwood that's growing out of the limestone. Well, the roots have actually gone into the, the water that's under that limestone. Extended That's why you can't kill them. <laughs> what is yes. They're extending, the roots are extending. <coughs> yes, and well, it, it's kind of going between layers of limestone, right. but the water is actually under that thin layer of limestone. So these kind of goofy things as well. The flint is the gray. The gray is right, surrounded by the limestone. Night hawks. Okay, so up here, this is a gate that marks the southern end of this side. So you've got to go through this gate and then we're going to take a left. Look at that. Ooh. Brad already knows what it is, but she don't get the answer. It does look yucky-ish. Okay, so we found some seed pods that are very distinctive. Come on over here and you can see them. You can see them. This is one of the best things that you can do with kids. Now, you will not be bringing kids out here. This is just, we're showing you around Kanza. But if you were to find these, this is, this, this is actually the fruit of the plant, and the seeds are inside, and you can still see that there's some seeds here. And what is it? Give it to a kid to peel. Okay, this is primrose. This is probably Missouri evening primrose with the size of these fruits. Do you concur? Oh, that's good to me. <laughs> You got, you, got a, a, you got a guy from the, the Missouri Evening Primrose. <laughs> <laughs> I got to start yeah, calling you on you. Yellow, you could, yellow flowers. Yes, sir. Very easy to pick out. Yes, sir. Does that form? 
Yeah. How does that form on the plant relative to the flower? Yeah, this yeah when you're done. This is the base mm -hmm. of the flower. This is the overall yeah, so of the flowers. So this is <laughs> like, a, like a, a rose hip? Correct. Yeah, same position? Correct. Yeah. Mm -hmm. We would call that here at Kanza a fire guard because it has been mown. We have removed the fuel from that. And we also, this is also a border between two different watersheds. And so the fire guard refers to the fact that the elimination of the fuel from the border will slow down, if not stop, a fire. And typically, and Chad, you're welcome to, to pipe in on this, when we do a burn, we'll have people and, and water tanks and hoses along the fire guard spraying this with water so the fire, if it were to come this way, would stop at that confluence. Mm.